Okie doke. So, this is our final week of classes. Is my understanding reflective of reality? Wow. Yeah, it's very exciting. Okay. Um, we are down to working on scenarios. So, the goal for today and Wednesday's class, so that you don't have to come in on Friday of exam week uh, for a traditional exam, is to basically do kind of an extended interactive exam session here. And this is going to be kind of an open book exercise because in the real world you don't have to memorize everything and you could not possibly memorize everything you need to about running a national park, um, even if you've been there for years and years and years. There are reasons that there are hundreds or in a few cases thousands of employees on site uh, running a place because it takes that kind of a team to pull this stuff off. So what we're going to do is Basically, for each of you individually answering, we're going to go through a bunch of events taken from the headlines, model on near future likelihoods, stuff like that, and basically turn each one of these events loose at your park. Something like a tsunami. It could be something like um, Steve Jobs invents the iPhone. How does that change recreation at your park? And so on and so forth. So for each of these scenarios, uh, I want you to answer for your particular park. And first we're going to record what the event is, so we're all sort of on the same page. Then the answer sort of shifts to you in terms of what's likely to be the outcome of that particular event at your particular park. All right. Now these are huge, open-ended loosely defined things. So, yes, this is basically your final exam. No, there is not a single right answer that you're supposed to magically know, okay? What we're testing here is your ability to synthesize the information that you put together for your park over the entire semester and think critically. What would some of the impacts be to the different classes or resources at your park based on that specific event? And what could you do about it? Question. I borrow a pencil and paper from someone. Yeah, I got a check. All right. So, to kind of ease into this so that we're not um, freaking anybody out. We're going to do the first couple of scenarios kind of together open answer, all right? So the idea here is that you guys are working in teams to do this stuff in the real world, so we can help each other out with this as well. It's a functional skill to acquire in terms of making sure that you can actually help somebody and receive help in a functional way from other people who are trying to achieve the same goal as you. All right, so let's uh, get everybody to come on up, put your name on this list and your park you are representing essentially this week on the second list, and go ahead and write it up there on the board, and that doesn't mean anything in terms of order, just go ahead and throw your name on up there so everybody can see everybody, and uh, we'll get into our first scenarios here in a sec. It's all very exciting. Okay, come on up. Chalk is at the board. So again, to kind of emphasize the mindset here, um, in the face of any potential test anxiety, there are not specific single right answers, okay? In the real world, you're never going to have a perfect response to a thing. Sometimes you get caught by footed with something you just didn't expect. It's going to be, you know, these are going to be a little bit kind of out of left field, like park, really? Yes, really. Um, and these are all driven by real events and examples, so um, I'm not taking close notes on if you have a specific phrase in your answer or something like that, okay? 
Again, what I'm looking for is the synthesis, the critical thinking, the lateral thinking for some of you. That is, thinking your way around a problem instead of plowing through it, and so on and so forth. So, it is okay if your answer for any of these particular scenarios is, this scenario literally can't happen at my park. Like, a tsunami, I'm 3,000 miles from the nearest ocean coast, I think we'll be okay. Or, if a tsunami does reach Kansas, we've probably got other problems, right? And uh, we're not immediately focused on park management first. Okay. Finishing off my list here, does anybody have any questions? Um, can I help fill in any gaps on your notes on your particular park? Uh, is there anything that's almost here from any of our previous class discussions or field exercises or field trip that would help answer your questions in a capable way? All right, if questions do come up or if something is unclear, feel free to ask. Cool. So on our list here, we've got Glacier National Park, Rocky Mountain, Olympic, White Sands. Very cool. I don't know much about that one. Mesa Verde, that Rock Cut, Indiana Dunes, Ozark National Scenic Riverways, and Zion. That's a pretty wide variety here, yeah? OK. Cool. So our first scenario is going to be a fairly simple one. That is. It is titled, They Hunt in Packs. So, scouts. Scouting has been a wonderful boon for national parks for the last century. And also, at times, it has been a bit of a cursed thing to have show up at the gates of your park. Um, imagine hundreds and hundreds of kids running around in your campgrounds, on your trails, uh, your other gravity features, your icon sites that are drawing people towards them, and so forth. What do you do when your entire camping capacity, it might be a few thousand sites at some of your larger parks, what do you do when every single one of your sites is reserved by various scouting troops, for a big event that they want to do, uh, convene a whole bunch of folks from an entire region, maybe, at your national park, and that's gonna be kind of their, their annual jamboree, their big celebration where they bring a whole bunch of folks together and all camp out and do all sorts of merit badge activities and so forth. And they have chosen your park, and they didn't tell you in advance, and now your entire reservation system for that, let's say about a month, in somewhere in the middle of your peak season. So for some of you in the northern tier, that's definitely summertime. In the southern tier parks, like Zion, for example, uh, the middle of the summer is pretty miserable. So maybe, let's say they're there in uh, early autumn or mid to late spring, something like that instead, to beat the heat a little bit. So what do you do? After figuring out what might the impacts be? Again, this first couple of scenarios, are going to be open discussion. So, anybody like to kick off the discussion with what might some of the impacts of having however many campsites you have multiplied by the capacity of each one of those campsites, that's your number of scouts showing up, 100% saturation. Like they had somebody camping with a really big credit card at January 1st. 12.01 a.m. when your online reservation system at reservation.gov, or recreation.gov, excuse me, uh, opened up and they snapped up everything for that month. What might some of the impacts of that be across your national park? Michael? I mean, just a bunch of kids, so they not, might not be the most like, environmentally mindful. Uh, could be like messing with trees and like breaking rocks and whatnot, or like leaving trash. Good answer. So for many years, um, 
my PhD advisor was on the national like advisory board or leadership board for uh, scouts and his thing is recreation ecology and so he advised scouting at a national and international now level on what does it really mean ecologically when you have a hatchet skills badge like what is that incentivizing millions of children to do every year that's a lot of hatchet scars around your campgrounds and so over time as like core crucially important as things like a hatchet badge might be to the perceived sort of nature of what it means to be a scout they revise that they changed that and at some levels they even just wiped out certain badges that were just physically not sustainable in any ecological way okay that's a good thought all right other impacts of scouting i mean i know that at uh, indiana dunes like in peak season it's going to be very crowded with people trying to visit the beaches there and it's kind of a cramped area with like thin roads you can kind of just get two cars by lots of people walking through so it doesn't be okay a safety hazard having that many people added on top of it in the campground in the area yeah so at acadia national park when it's peak season and there are way more cars than there are parking lot spaces and it costs them about ten thousand bucks a space to put out there right so they managed for fixed limited sizes they have people parking up and down the road to access certain popular spots like up to a mile or two away from that spot can you imagine walking in traffic for a mile and a half with your family of you, your partner, spouse, whatever, maybe two, three kids, kind of weaving in and out of traffic and stuff like that. Huge safety concern and ecological impact concern, right? Some of those folks are gonna not walk on whatever pathway is there. Some of them are gonna be crashing through the woods at the side of the road, and so the impact spreads out from the road in terms of trampling and stuff like that. Also, there's the crucial, crucial, crucial social impact of crowding. So that beach has a certain number of square meters of habitat for humans. And each human is showing up needing a certain number of those square meters for him or her or themselves. And that is a zero sum game, which is every square meter that I'm taking up with my beach towel and my acoustic sound print and so on and so forth, Lots of square meter that somebody else can't use. Or if they try to use it, it's going to be right up on top of us and it's super awkward with strangers and somebody else's kids running across your towel and knocking over your koozie to drink and stuff like that. Getting sand in your fancy Yeti cooler and messing up the seals. And oh my God, do these kids even know how expensive? Crowding is a very serious thing. And it leads to a cascading failure across other impacts. When we feel crowded, we spread out in response we disperse and some of that dispersal can be in places where you the park ranger did not intend for that to happen other impacts question yeah, the dunes especially like erosion is a huge problem with the dunes themselves like they're very fragile to people in groups or just individually over time walking over them and blowing them out and eventually eroding them completely yeah dune incision what it's called can destroy literally an entire dune in a single storm event once that incision is cut by people walking over those grasses and tearing up those fine root hairs. Okay. Other questions, thoughts, impacts? Another impact? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I know, like in Rocky Mountain, there's a bunch of moose and elk, and you know, all the kids, they don't know how to behave around them. So that puts uh, safety concern on the wildlife themselves and the kids. So, especially like on those roads where they stop and get too close. All right, so this is going to be type one direct incursion impact to the wildlife, we call it harassment. And for the kids, um, we haven't, I don't think we've shown it this semester, but there's a bunch of videos of kids getting gored or thrown or trampled at our national parks. It's not exact, exactly the uh, outstanding recreational value that folks are accessing your park for, right? And we know that brains develop risk assessment last. 
between ages 23 and 25. Your brain isn't fully developed until you reach the end of age 25. So, we can <coughs> fairly expect that these kids who literally don't have a brain for this, doing stuff like playing chicken, running up on feral, regular wildlife that are gonna adopt a defensive stance. Okay, cool, Ian. I think about kids, I think that they eat a lot, and like a lot of snacks and stuff, so there's going to be a lot of more trash that weekend. Okay. With like fruit snack wrappers, granola bar wrappers, just all that's gonna add up with the whole place being booked out with a bunch of kids camping. Okay. So, you're gonna need more people just to upkeep facilities and FDF trash and stuff. And for those of you who've worked with a state or federal organization, how quickly can you hire extra help? Yeah, you can, right? Okay. Uh, Holzmuller just spent 11 months trying to hire a staff researcher. 11 months. And there was some, like, international visa concerns, stuff like that, but that's ridiculous. I mean, can you imagine waiting on some employer who's like, I would love to hire you. Can you just give me almost a year of your life without pay? And I'll hire you at the end, I promise. Right? So, it's a capacity issue. So, um, in the field we would call this the elasticity of supply. How much can we flex or stretch relative to what the day-to-day -day needs are versus what the average is that we're kind of targeting and planning for. Okay, cool. So, this is a pretty good range of impacts. We've got some physical, we've got some social, we've got some economic impacts because fixing some of these other impacts is going to cost a lot of money. And we've got pretty much the whole spectrum covered. Okay, so that's a pretty good range of answers for the impacts section of any one of these particular events. Okay, <coughs> all right, so same kind of move. For your particular park, what's the response? What's the plan? Task out like a ranger or someone that knows their stuff and like give the kids like a good talk maybe once a day about reminding them about fines and whatnot. As well as why, as well as like tasking out another ranger to um, maybe teach like an environmental science merit badge or something like that. So they kind of like drill the kids about okay, make sure you're cleaning up and don't mess with the animals. Just as like gentle reminders. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna. For any of our rangers that are certified as trainers or master educators and leave no trace, they're going to be pretty valuable assets to you for this month straight that these thousands of children running around. Okay? All right. Michael's answer supposes that we're going to have these people on site. Yeah. Uh, like update the website of the park saying uh, all the campsites have been full so that people stop coming in. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so recreation.gov does exactly that. So that piece, um, that is part of the answer, and that's a valid answer. Uh, that one, fortunately, is taken care of. It's a fully built out online reservation system. Um, it's pretty well customized to each of the needs and seasons of each of the individual campgrounds, too. Good stuff. Good answer. All right, so we'll stop the bleeding, right? We won't have more people than that coming in trying to take over those campsites. Now, we're still going to have everybody else who's got an Airbnb, or a bed and breakfast, or a hotel, or a motel, or a free stealth site on the National Forest right next to your national park. Does anybody have a National Forest neighbor like physically touching the perimeter of your national park? Yeah. At least two. Yeah, so three. So, pretty much, um, Anytime there's a national forest within even a couple of hours away from a major popular national park, um, services like Campendium um, and other stealth camping, like it's basically Google Maps for free campsites outside of national parks. I use it all the time in uh, teaching forestry rec summer camp because sometimes we just need extra big sites that. Uh, the national park can't get to us. So, we should think about, okay, even if our capacity is full, 
our on-site day-to-day capacity is going to be, or on-site actual use is going to be much, much higher than that. And that's okay. Like that's a normal state of things, right? Like these sites don't um, wide spots in the road, spots you can pull off of the camper or something. Uh, it's called dry camping. There's no hookups or anything, but it can be self-sufficient for you know, a week or two. No big deal. Um, like those are by and large already created. They've been around for decades and decades. It's not a surprise when overflow of use starts to occupy all those and still come into your park for the whole day or uh, head into your park and leave their vehicle at the back backcountry office for the week and go backpacking inside your space even though they don't have like a tent site uh, in any of the developed campgrounds. So that's okay. All right, really good answer. All right, other responses or things we can do to plan in advance of something like this if we think this might someday be a thing. You know, if it's somewhere that's real remote, they probably need to have extra medical staff on hand. Yeah. And those are really hard to find. So certified wilderness EMTs, wilderness first responders, um, interagency dispatch with uh, helicopter, medical, or CASIVAC, as they say in the popular first person shooter video games, uh, casualty evacuation. Um, that's not cheap. That is not safe for those medical responders. They are wearing their bodies out or putting their bodies on the line to try and get somebody back to definitive medical care. Um, at the Grand Canyon, for example, you'll see uh, wilderness EMTs jogging down Bright Angel Trail up to once or twice a day in peak season, and they're carrying 80 pound packs filled with medical gear to try and get to people because heat stroke doesn't wait for anything. It just happens. All right, there's another hand somewhere, yeah. I was gonna say something about like making sure that there's signs up to like direct people towards like specific things like medical or like the nearest um like ranger station or anything like that yeah if they don't like if there's not service there so they are able to figure out how to get to these places mm -hmm. all right so it's going to be under the plan we've got our strategic responses around right? our four different strategy areas of increasing supply in real or effective terms, modifying visitor use either directly with interdiction, fines, fencing, stuff like that, or indirectly through information and education. This is going to be a popular and, oh cool, we get to talk with the ranger for a while. That's a very positive thing for most people. Information and education works pretty well when it's right at the front or right before somebody is going to be tempted to do something dumb or something illegal, or something unsafe, all right? It's gotta be right before. Okay, yeah. I was gonna say, similar to like a peak weekend of the year where like, you know, Labor Day, Memorial Day weekends are usually really crowded. You see that this is happening one weekend, like just ahead and plan on scheduling as many of your employees as you can to work that weekend, whether it be like rangers, be doing trolls, or people taking care of bathrooms and trash and everything else. Yeah, so surge staffing, yeah. yeah. Gonna eat a bunch of cost and overtime, right? Yeah. So a typical law enforcement ranger, um, starting out on day one is, you know, making 50, 60,000 bucks, whatever it is, but the total cost to the park for fielding that person for one season is two to three times that much for their vehicle, for their certifications, for their personal equipment, um, for the support that has to grow as you add more people and stuff like that, it's usually, between 100 and 150,000 for each 50,000 dollar range you've got out there. So, yeah, you may have to. Like, they're just sometimes you just gotta run the budget in the red for a little while and tighten up a little bit later on to sort of ride the ship financially. But you know, if people's lives are on the line, then we'll get the staffing in place. Good answer. Anybody else? Yeah. I have one more thought. Like. Knowing that there's a ton of kids coming into your park and like not every scoutmaster is that competent when it comes to like how to be ecologically sound. Maybe like have your rangers kind of like do like a whole welcome brief with 
the scout troops and whatnot, like saying like, hey, don't go cut and hatchet like all of our saplings down. Like, here's kind of like how to enjoy it and not ruin our campsite for everyone else. Yeah. It's kind of like a welcome friendly, lay down the law, and have a good time, see you later. Mm -hmm. So this is according to a couple of different primary techniques in visitor contact. We've got the direct route to persuasion, that is what you tell somebody or what you put on the sign or whatever. And then there's the indirect route to persuasion where maybe you don't rely on a sign, maybe for sort of safety critical stuff, a sign can get passed by pretty easily, even though it's way cheaper than fielding an additional ranger out there. But seeing somebody in uniform, in particular a law enforcement ranger, um, this contact can be part of a presence patrol, you know, helping folks understand this is a patrolled space and oh, there must be certain ways to sort of behave and some certain behaviors to avoid. That's all relying on the indirect or peripheral route to persuasion. Human behavior is highly predictable. All right, cool. All right, so this is a bunch of good options here. We also have potentially our remaining two strategies, which would be to modify the resources at hand to be more resistant or resilient uh, from impacts. And then the fourth and final big strategy would be to limit use, either temporarily in space or time, or permanently as a response to this in space or time. So. One other possible answer for something like this might be you have somebody kind of looking through the reservations and they have that butt puckering moment of, oh God, this is going to be a 3,000 young campers. This is going to be a madhouse. And they come and knock on your door as the superintendent. You have this open door policy, you a friendly superintendent. And they say, boss, we got a problem. And you can say as a superintendent, okay, let's have somebody kind of go back through and audit all of those reservations if this is all one really ultimately one big group like if those are all on the same credit card that's not what your campgrounds are designed for in fact large group activities and stuff like that fall pretty squarely into the purview of what are called special use permits and so you can legitimately, you are absolutely within your right and your scope or your domain to contact that person with a credit card and say, hey, you know, we noticed that you guys took up the entire national park for a month while we're gonna have literally a million other visitors. Um, could we work with you? We'd love to refund you the cost of every one of those campsites. We'll eat the minor fee, 3% to refund a transaction and we'll work with you here in advance. It's eight months before everybody's gonna show up at this park. Um, let's get you on a special use permit. We actually have other facilities that might work better for you. A big open area that is open bedrock that the kids can camp on without creating a muddy morass of your entire campground in a month's time. Or we have a large, like a large group facility center that can't handle 3,000 kids at once, but we could definitely do up to about 1,800. And could you set it up where you're cycling kids in and out, but staying below that 1,800? And I'm gonna assign several people on my staff to work exclusively with you, because this is really important when we get this right, and protect the resources, and also figure out a way for you guys and gals to all enjoy this national park and you know bring your scouting we don't want to close the doors on you, but we've got to figure out how to make it work for everybody involved, including the resources a lot of voice like the wildlife. Michael. For rec camp, do you use the special use permits? Say For rec camp, do you use those permits? Sometimes we do. Uh, it depends very much on the class size. So the year that I had 35 students and we were in like eight different vans and stuff like that. Um, that is just too many to show up at a regular campsite with a regular reservation. Um, so where we could, we use large group sites. And large group sites can handle up to, usually up to about 150 people at a time for the real big ones. Um, and more commonly, there are sites with 30, 40, 50 person capacity. And 
those are all fine. Um, every once in a while when that group is that big, we gotta kind of rework our approach a little bit. Like if we go out west with a group that large, I'll take us camping and we'll sort of radiate out from a couple of base camps along the way on BLM land where those special use permits are either not needed or really easy to get and really cheap. Uh, for a national park, this permitting process can take the better part of a year, uh, depending on what you want to do. Like if you want to have a super cool wedding with drone photography and all this stuff, um, like a Kardashian style wedding off in the wilderness or something like that, that's the better part of a year of planning and lots and lots of skilled people working on that special use permit application. It can be really long and have an itemized menu of stuff like, okay, if you bring this many people, you're going to have to pay this many thousands of dollars to fund the ecological restoration that we know from past experience is going to have to be done after a group this size. Just doesn't matter how ecologically minded folks are, we have, we create impacts as a function of existing. Um, so that's a thing. So special use permits, yeah, absolutely on summer camp. In some places that require them, other years the group is small and nimble and we're basically like a family group. Um, but yeah, like anytime any of your classes go over to the Shawnee National Forest, that technically should be covered legally under a special use permit with the Forest Service every time. So yeah, good question. All right, so fourth and finally, relative to the impacts and relative to our options on responding to those impacts or planning for them in advance if we get any notice, how's that going to work? Like, we have some good ideas, we have some threats coming in, what happens when we interface those two things? Okay, so this is the most hard to pin down on these scenarios. So, how would a special use permit to put everybody in a, like a large group area? Would that kind of work okay? Would that help? How would it, how would it? Whenever you do like a special like group permit like that, do they ever like kind of assign, I guess, like assign a ranger to like kind of just check in every once in a while? Yeah. Like that way they know like they're not causing like issues or anything like yeah, so in the admin building of the parks management complex or whatever, it's basically like an office cluster. <clears throat> you get the person in the special use permits office as a part of the recreation division. There's like recreation resources, facilities, maintenance, you know, different sections of the national park, uh, different human staffing sections of the park. And um, the person in that special use permits office is liaising between the trail shop that might need to pay extra close attention to the access trails at this group campsite, make sure they're maybe put down a couple of dump truck loads of gravel on that short section of path because we know it's going to get hammered to hell. Um, so it's not just like one person assigned, it's typically a bunch of different people in different roles according to the needs and the timing and the location of that particular special use activity. Um, and generally speaking, this is not, it's not meant to be like a punishment, like, oh man, you better fill out this form or we're not going to let you do anything. It's more like a, you know, we're happy to have you here, let's figure this out kind of a thing. So the figuring out is lining up the people who are going to be doing an extra loop on their presence patrol as a law enforcement ranger or force protection officer. Um, it's going to be the interpretive staff. Um, let's put together, you know, three nights a week for that month. Let's put together extra amphitheater talks, and maybe they don't have to develop anything new for those, but it could be something like um, just more repetitions of previously developed campfire talks kind of thing. Okay, that's a good question. All right, cool. So we see how this works? Awesome. All right, next one we'll do together real quick, uh, and then We'll get into the rest and we can still talk through things as a group 
with the rest as well, but it'll be more specific answers for your particular park instead of this sort of general sense of things. All right, so it is January 1st at your park. You got an all-hands meeting of all of the full-time permanent on-site staff because things are going to get, you know, busy in the shoulder and then the peak season and then the shoulder season before you get to next winter's kind of hibernation period where you can catch up and um, get ahead on different projects you're working on long term as you're running the park. And somebody raises their hand when you ask, okay, what do we need to be aware of team this year? Somebody says, um, you know, per my TPS reports uh, I've been filing over the last couple of months, we're finding a lot of anhydrous tanks in this particular section of the park. And typically it's a section near I back entrance of the park where visibility and ranger presence are low, but access is high. So, anhydrous tanks, for those of you not familiar with, are used in cooking methamphetamine. And anhydrous ammonia is stolen typically from farm fields, larger industrial ag operations where they have huge tanks of ammonia that they're going to basically spray onto the field as fertilizer. And the nitrogen in that ammonia is really useful for all sorts of things. Um, yeah, VBIEDs and drugs alike, right? Ammonia, you can get a lot of stuff done with. Anyway. So this ranger is like, you know, we've not, I went back through our records, um, our after action reports for like the past 50 years, and we've never really had a problem with anhydrous ammonia tanks um, really anywhere. But in the past three months over, the, you know, October, November, December of our previous year uh, in the winter season, we, we found a tank or two every single month. And they're not all in the same place, but they're all in sort of the same clustered area. What should we do, boss? That's our event. People are making drugs in your national park. And I should note that this is runaway by far, by orders of magnitude, more of an issue at national forests than it is national parks because the human presence on a national forest is typically much, much lower. And so you can get more meth cooking or more weed growing done before aerial remote sensing and photogrammetry uh, became a thing. Um, but yeah, some of our alums in the past have called me up and said, yeah, this is the thing we're dealing with right now. So what do you do? What are our impacts? And Ammonia tanks, just so you know, because you can make improvised explosives from anhydrous ammonia, among lots of other things, these tanks are very prone to explode because you're cooking methamphetamine, and that means like flames plus fuel and oxidant all together. And, you know, the drug kingpins, they're not sending their best, uh, to paraphrase a previous president. Um, we can have lots of explosions. We can have people killed just at random in the middle of your national park or forest and just have like a crater in the forest. Okay. So what do you do? Okay. Or impact. Is, are we talking like the size of like anhydrous tanks like that they are like putting on the fields or are they yeah. like smaller? No, full size. <laughs> yeah. You'd be amazed what somebody will try to steal. Yeah. Okay. So like semi tractor trailer size tanks? Yeah. Um, well, you have to have a license to even like put that on a field. Doesn't matter. <laughs> if <laughs> you got the license, if you got everything all yeah, good to go, somebody can just like back a trailer up and steal your stuff and so get I was in trouble. Just saying that because like it's that bad. Yeah. Like it's super like reactive with everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Uh, that's just a disaster in itself. You got a couple of meth heads stealing an anhydrous tank. <laughs> this is not an isolated thing. This is all over the place. This is happening on the Shawnee and has been for 15 years. All right? So don't go cross country alone in the Shawnee. As weird as that sounds, I have to say stuff like that because it's not just the question of the anhydrous tank. 
it's also the question of the booby traps around it. So with marijuana grow operations out west in Colorado and California, especially before legalization and stuff like that, there were found a whole bunch of, for example, um, Punji stake traps where you were cutting cane at an angle, so forming basically a hypodermic needle shape and then planting a bunch of those in basically pit traps that be covered with leaves and stuff like that so people would fall in them if they got too close to the marijuana grow operation. And in some of those cases, there were also found fish hooks strung from the foliage at eye level. Um, I mean, really nasty stuff. Some of the punji steaks were actually smeared with human feces to make uh, sepsis and infection a very serious consequence, in addition to like the literally crippling puncture wounds, uh, deep puncture wounds that you would get from falling into one of those traps. Okay, so this is this is a big deal. Up on somebody cooking. Yeah, yeah, get shot. Yeah, or blown up. Right. All right, so what are some of the impacts? Environmental and safety, for yeah. sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, resource impacts, right? When one of these goes up, it's like a bomb went off because if you were going to drop a bomb, it wouldn't be too chemically different. Okay. I was going to say it just, it's more dangerous for visitors that might stumble upon this sort of thing, and wildlife, and ecologically speaking, it's going to be horrible for, you know, living creatures that might find one of these, like, empty tanks and try to make a nest near it, or if it starts leaching into the ground, it starts corroding or something. Yeah, so the ecological or the, especially the wildlife, excuse me, impacts uh, associated with this are not just the area of the tank, it's the whole area around and the entire access route that most mobile wildlife is going to get scared away from, get displaced from, like we talked about as a wildlife response. Okay, so this is a big deal and it reaches farther than the physical footprint of the grow operation or the meth lab or whatever. Other impacts? Oh, this is just another question about it. Do they like camouflage? Like, I obviously don't know anything about <laughs> hiding a meth lab in the woods or anything like that, but like, do they like, hide it like by camouflaging or do they like try burying it or what like how do they do they just throw it out there and it's very visible for people to see like sort of yeah. deal yeah so um that's a good question um and so for the the recording the question is do they try to camouflage this stuff or dig them in on the ground put camo netting over it or something um not really these are set up very quickly. They're trying to use up the ammonia as fast as they can, leading to lots of accidents and stuff like that. And, you know, this isn't, they're not putting any more effort into this than they absolutely have to. Um, so, at least generally speaking, um, maybe, it's a, maybe it's a sampling bias of, maybe some people really are camouflaging. We don't even know those are there. We're just finding the dumb ones, right? Survivorship bias, sample bias. Okay, so um, yeah, generally speaking, we can we can figure on the scene like pretty easy to see from the air, unless it's like full canopy leaf on season. Um, and sometimes, you know, in a particular spot, they'll get as far off into the woods as they can. They're trying to not be visible from the road but that has to be through an area that's accessible by the road um, to trailer the thing in. And uh, sometimes the vehicle will get kind of bogged down and they can't press it back any further, so they'll just do it there and they'll go even faster because they can be seen from, you know, like an internal park access road. So, yeah. All right. Responses for this. One other impact, let me fill in one other gap for us. There's a perception impact. When everybody else learns that, oh, well, let's go to Met Lab National Park, right? Even if you address the situation the next day, those news stories, they don't stop existing. They don't stop showing up in people's searches about your national park, even years later. So this is absolutely a thing. 
I think the first thing you would do is set up like trail cams or just go into evidence collection mode and like start contacting some of those three letter agencies from Washington, like the DEA or you know, whoever's in charge of like catching these guys on a bigger scale because they're gonna have more resources and more training with this stuff. Good answer. Delegate, delegate, delegate. Because you know what flows downhill, right? No, I'm kidding. That, that, that is actually a really good answer. Um, and depending on the scale of the, the crime that's happening, um, you know, if it looks like it's just kind of a one-off thing, somebody's moved into the area and they're just starting to kind of put out feelers, see what they can get away with and stuff like that, um, you know, typically an agency will try to sort of quash that in-house as quickly as possible and send a strong message to anybody else thinking about it. Um, but to the extent that, you know, we've started seeing some repetition over months in this particular scenario, yeah, there is absolutely nothing wrong with bringing in, I mean, technically you're the feds too, but bringing in the other feds where this is their full-time job. Yeah, let you get back to park rangering. Okay, cool. All right. Other plans and responses? What else can we do about this? If there is not like a clear cut like way to get in like a trail or something that they're able to like move through, do they just like start clearing their own paths? Yes. Okay. I was gonna say like because I didn't know if there was a way to like kind of contain like traffic to like one area or if they would just start going wherever they feel like. Yeah. So there's a solution in there somewhere. I mean, can we gate off that area? Maybe, maybe not. Usually a lot of national parks, does your national park have a bunch of redundant roads? Or if you close off a road, it closes off all of the access to the area behind that road. Which is it for your park? Anybody? Uh, for Glacier, there's one really big road and then like a couple other small ones, but like things, the going to sea road is the name of it. It's a large road that goes, cuts through the center of the park. You're able to uh, get all the accessibility from there other than like, like many glacier. Okay, right on. So that's a very common setup. You got one main artery road or one main loop road through, and then typically several much smaller sort of feeder roads that may not even connect with that main road system. Uh, those we might be able to close off temporarily or severely intensively. The yeah. Olympic National Park is basically a big mountain, so there's a road that goes all the way around it, and then there's just a lot of roads that will get you in close for different hiking trails in different areas. So that is easy and hard to right. close off, right? That ring road, we can't touch that, right? Um, but any of those smaller access roads, yeah, maybe. Okay, cool. All right, and outcomes. How are our plans likely to work with dealing with meth heads? Does this stuff work? I mean, we have some ideas. Yeah. I mean, I like talk, contacting like the DA or something like that. You don't want to put like the National Forest people in really that much amount of um, danger. I mean, hope not to. Someone that has like far less training. So, signing or trying to get the DA to come out to help you out, help out with that. I think it was something that's very helpful. So, protecting, I'd say, your people. Okay, cool. All right. You guys ready for your first one? We can still talk stuff out if you're rolling through an idea and you're not totally sure how it would play out. Okay, it's not a silent head down kind of a test. All right. More collaborative than that. Our first real scenario is related and based on an encounter or an interdiction that I witnessed on the Shawnee National Forest. It's really exciting. You get a superintendent notification from, in that case it was a forest protection officer, for you it would be a law enforcement ranger in the National Park Service instead of the Forest Service. You get notification that folks are digging and stealing root vegetables for sale on the Asian black market. And that ginseng is worth 
$1,500 a pound for wild grown on particular Southeast Asian black markets. 1500 bucks a pound. It's a very slow growing vegetable. It can take 10 to 15 years to mature to economically harvestable or useful status. And pretty much all the efforts to farm ginseng have led to provision of a noticeably substandard or lower quality product. It's just not the same as the wild type. Demand is so high that people trying to establish ginseng grow operations in the United States have been murdered for their efforts. So in 2010, when I saw a forest protection officer, an alumni of our SIU forestry program, sprint into the woods with his hand on his gun and drag out by an ankle an illegal ginseng digger off of the Shawnee National Forest and throw him in the back of his truck so we could arrest the guy. This is a real thing, a real scenario. All right, so our event is ginseng digging. First question, is this possible at your national park? It grows in habitats like the Shawnee. If it's not possible at your park to have this particular problem, maybe you're not so worried about this scenario. Yeah. There is ginseng at Black Park, but also with uh, things like leeks and one of their comically poached as well. Yeah. Tell you what, let's widen this out a little bit. Let's say, pick off the list for your national park, whatever works. Ginseng, leeks. Tree tumors. What else? People have been caught backpacking gas powered rock saws into places like Canyonlands National Park to saw petroglyphs out of the rock face and sell them. Or just say them all. some kind of very precious, highly desirable resource, whatever that might look like at your park. What are the impacts associated with that? And don't feel like you need to write beautiful florid essays, right? We're a bunch of busy foresters. Just let me know in a sentence or two for each thought. You can even do a bulleted list if that's how you like to roll. Just like with your national park packet you've been putting together. Think about, are there any economic impacts? Are there any social, like experiential impacts to other visitors? Are there cultural resource impacts, like irreplaceable resources getting liberated? Are there any ecological, like species or richness and diversity, species composition type impacts? forest composition, whatever the case may be. One really good answer for impacts of this kind, where it's from a negative or depreciative behavior, is 
the impact of having releaser cues present is a huge impact, a negative one. That is, if somebody sees a ginseng dig site after the fact, the person's already gone and started selling off the ginseng or whatever, or the leeks or the tree cankers or whatever. The next person sees that site and goes, huh, I wonder what happened here. Oh, I bet they were digging ginseng. Oh, I wonder how much money they made. Oh, I wonder if I could do that. I got a shovel. So that releaser cue can lead to one, two, ten. So this exponential growing of other people realizing that this is an interesting thing to do, whether or not it's wise or moral or sustainable or anything, you can put the idea in other people's head. You can incept that idea with a releaser cue. two responses if you're not there yet. Uh, let's see. So again, we've got our four major strategies. We can increase supply of a resource in real or effective terms. It may or may not help in the situation. We can modify visitor use of those resources or presence around them. Changing the activity that you do or indirectly educating them or directly arresting them, or what have you. Third, we can modify the resource, in some cases, to be more resistant to impacts, more resilient from impacts. Under this category would be moving the resource to hide it in plain sight somewhere else. And our fourth and final strategy, our least desirable one, but an effective one nonetheless, we can temporarily or permanently limit use and access to that area of the resource if necessary. That might be a more specific or interesting or useful tactic underneath any of those four broad strategies. Quote Dr. Phil, how's that working for you? What would the outcomes of your particular strategies and tactics likely do? Would it work? Would it cause any kind of side effect, follow on problems? That's okay if it does. Maybe we can cope with those better than letting somebody dig up the national park and sell it. Done with this one, if you want to take a quick stretch break, uh, move around, get some water, something like that. That was a good moment to do that.
every once in a while we'll see where tree crank cankers have been stolen off us. I don't, you know, you know, it's just so random and so spread out. That, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's not a victimless crime, but it's hard to catch. It's real hard to catch. We do have ginseng people down by us, but that guy is super secretive. They don't play around with that, yeah. Well, they don't want nobody else to know where it's at. They can't take all of it. They take all of it. Their cash crop's gone. So. If someone gets caught with it, can you, like, do they replant it? Or, like, is it just, like, done for it? Like, they can't put it back? So if you're not catching somebody like in the act of digging, it's kind of gone after that. Um, it's not a legal hat, it's just a legal like, get off the National Forest or the Park Service. Yeah. You can dig it on your own, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ginseng's good stuff. Like it works great, but um, it's just tough to produce in the way that people want it. When most people dig it. I mean, anything that's gonna be semi-close to the roads has been gone for years. So they gotta go way out in the woods to and they know where it's at. Yeah. And it only takes so much of it so you know, there's more next year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they wanna make sure nobody knows where they're at so they don't want anybody else to go get it. Yeah, the more the more long term sustainable version of this that's way less of a problem, uh, would be like mushroom gathering on forests and stuff like that. You know, if somebody grabs five, ten pounds of morels or something, um, by putting in the legwork of gathering that stuff. Do you care? No, but 10, 15 pounds of ginseng, that's a big deal. But ginseng, most of ginseng thieves do do it kind of responsibly because they want to make sure it's there next year. You know, there was, uh, in, in Cook County, the East is a big problem with them being pushed off of uh, Forest Reserve property. And there was a, I forget what, which TV show it was. There was one where they go and they tour different restaurants in Chicago and like show what chefs are doing. And one of the chefs brought like the crew out into a forest reserve where he dug up leaks on camera from the forest reserve and then went back and sold them at his restaurant. Did he and go like to like promoting like yeah I like collect them from nearby preserves and so it's like oh my god like he and he got like just a tiny little fine for that like. Nothing that's going to deter it, but okay. it's like just going out and promoting. Well, yeah, that's a lot of free advertising for him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he could probably lose like his food handling certifications for doing that too, because like as a chef, you can't just like sell your homegrown vegetables or whatever at your restaurant. It has to be from like a certified like provider. I hope so. Yeah. I mean, that, that was crazy. I heard about that. Right. Yeah. On paper, it's a good system. The system works if you work it, right? But, but, um, yeah, so, you know, there's, you can see the incentive for people, even on stuff that, that is legal and responsible and sustainable and stuff like that. Like, uh, anybody ever been to Scratch Brewery over in Ava? That's a fun spot. And they make a bunch of really bizarre micro brews, or I guess home brews at their scale. Um, stuff with like basil and stuff like that gathered off of the nearby forest and they're delicious and weird and it's this sort of cool artsy bizarre little spot just like off in the middle of Ava or outside of Ava and uh, that's great like we're all a little bit better for the fact that Scratch Brewery exists and is doing stuff that way um, and they put a high emphasis a high visible emphasis on gathering things seasonally and sustainably because that's their business model, right? Like Carrie's saying here um, with the ginseng. But it's not necessarily sort of a, an even solution across all of these different species based on their growth characteristics and their economic demand. Okay, cool. Does anybody have any questions or other? Yeah, Michael. Uh, real quick on Scratch. According to some Snobby Beer article, Scratch got like pretty high up in the top 25 breweries in the United States. Oh, kind of neat little claim from Bain in Southern Illinois. Wow. Okay. That's cool. I took my wife there for a date. I checked the box. No, I'm just kidding. Um, okay. 
All right, you guys ready for another one? All right, I'm gonna feel personally attacked by this one, but it's okay. All right, I'm gonna do my best Zoolander impression for those of you who were alive when that movie came out. I know it's been like 50 years or so, uh, back when Ben Stiller was not as old as he looks now. This one is titled, But Why Are They All Rich, Educated, Retired White Males? So, here is our next event. Your NVUM, your National Visitor Use Monitoring Survey results, come out, indicating a homogeneous recreation population year in and year out. You're getting the same kinds of people, not necessarily the same individuals, but the same kinds of people, and there's just not really any diversity there. And as it turns out, it's pretty much mid to late career or especially retired folks they skew highly educated because with higher education tends to get higher income and more discretionary income means more recreation and it tends to be a certain kind of person in this case um, not international not minority populations etc 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 so you connect the dots with that, or between that NVUM report saying there's kind of a usual suspect showing up en masse or in large groups in large proportion at your park. And you also, around that time, realize your popular support across the entire American public. So, not just people who are visiting your park, but people who are visiting other parks and people who are not visiting parks. So, all of America. Your popular support among the entire American public is shrinking as a percentage of supporters as these, quite frankly, boomers age out and start dying. What do you do? That's our event, the great boomer die-off. What might be some impacts? This one's a little bit different than we're maybe used to thinking about. What might be some of the negative impacts of having kind of a usual customer and that customer kind of aging out? And younger folks, folks from other backgrounds, don't really have recreating in the traditional way your traditional national park kind of front and center like the boomers do. My question. Uh, oh, I was going to say. Comment. Impact. Unless we are not that far down. You're good. Um, an impact, I think, would be, uh, from what I've observed, I mean, I think that uh, recreation is more of like an intense, I guess you'd say, like rock climbing, backpacking, trail running, uh, rafting is becoming like more popular. So I think that something that would be an impact is you'd see a lot more people in areas that usually don't get as much foot traffic. Okay. So we're seeing, or maybe, if we're paying all of our attention to this National Visitor Use Survey, the boomers in their millions are not showing up anymore or near as much. Um, not able to get out on those trails or full send the dynamic moves on that sport route, something like that, as they're 85 years old. But maybe that means we're just looking in the wrong place. Okay, valid. So I'm just trying to think, our event is like the survey showed us this one demographic and also our use is declining or yeah so use is well do you know what the use trend is at your particular park is it rapidly growing has it kind of leveled off since about 1985 like some parks have some major national parks or is it just kind of slowing down a little bit some of the national battlefields for example um, struggle to get more than 50, 60,000 visitors, especially some of the smaller ones. Um, and as the Civil War Enthusiast Club gets kind of older, you know, they are seeing fewer visitors, aside from sort of the, the requisite nearby buses full of school kids every year for a field trip. I wouldn't mind it growing, but I thought like across the board for like most, if not all national parks, they were growing. Mm -hmm. Correct but the usual suspects are not. So you're getting more of folks who are not 
fitting kind of the pattern that we've been managing for for the last 75 years. So are we still managing in the right direction? Gary. So is the event right of Boomer die off? Because Boomer's not really my national park's main people. Okay, so contextualize it to your national park. If you don't have any boomers, you're not worried about this. Oh, dear, but not, that's not. If they're not a huge proportion of your visitation, yeah, then you're good. They're a fair amount, but it's, I think, a lot more diverse as far as age groups in most mm -hmm. of the other parks. Yeah, those are more of a family place than a family or younger. Like rich old people, yeah, for sure. You know, 20 somethings on the river. Yeah, so that's a good thing, right? That majority of, of Caucasians is going to be in short order um, the majority minority. Uh, that is, it'll be less than 50% of the US population uh, not too long from now. Which is interesting, or beautiful, or scary, depending on your worldview. To the border with Illinois, it's not far at all to get to some parts of Chicago. It's a little bit further, but there's a lot of people from Illinois that go there. Okay. Probably more than people in Indiana during peak seasons. Yeah, because I mean, there's what like Gary, Indiana, up there, but it's not near as big as Chicago, right? Yeah. Okay. So the presence of a large city is going to typically mean a lot more diversity available uh, for people who can choose to go. And proximity means that if it's really close, it's what we call like a Seno Canal National Historic Park, which runs right through the middle of Washington, D.C., or right through the, the bottom southwest corner. Uh, it's a dog walking park. Like you can go on your lunch break and walk your dog for a mile at Seno Canal National Historic Park. It's preserving a bunch of spots from the late 1700s, so a really cool historic park. And people just kind of, the uh, lower socioeconomic status folks living in that area, um, next to some of the richest people in the world, literally, uh, are going there to catch fish for dinner. So subsistence fishing. And other folks are walking their, their clone Weimaraner of their beloved family pet that died in you know 2006 or something like that and they just couldn't bear to be apart from fluffy so they cloned him um it's a strange place dc is a very very strange place to be a park ranger anyway um okay so impacts response plan what do you guys think what could we do at your particular park so always contextualize your answer to your park yeah Sarah. Um. This is more of like a response, but just to like survey people as to like what they're like, what recreation they're doing and seeing if that's something that you're managing for or if that's yeah. something that you need to look into like to manage. Okay, so supply and demand questions. And this is pretty straightforward visitor information to gather. We gather this stuff every year across a lot of parks. And we're also gathering things like sort of the, the shadow side of that. So for example, out in the desert southwest, um, where rock climbing is super popular, but the National Park Service uh, in some places is not able to accommodate or allow rock climbing because it just permanently damages some of the softer sandstone, like uh, parts of the Navajo Formation. Um, like big, big redstone walls. Um, super popular, super high demand, and since the Park Service can't make that or have that particular style of climbing be sustainable with respect to that bedrock resource, they shut it off. But folks in the climbing community don't want to be shut off from some honest-to-God world-class rock climbing opportunities. 
And Wall Street, right outside of Moab, Utah, is awesome as well. Same kind of sandstone, but it's super busy. It's constantly crawling with rock climbers. And so wouldn't it be nice if I could just take my, you know, my uh, van again, or my uh, Volkswagen camper van and just be a dirtbag climber out in the back part of such and such national park, but Canyonland, something like that, and have thousands of extra miles of wall to climb, but have to kind of do it on the down low. So when I took students out to, um, uh, this would have been out of Zion, uh, we went canyoneering one day, and the guy, <laughs> Uh, he didn't really sort of realize that we were a forestry program training to be rangers and stuff like that. And he waxed on for a couple of hours. We took him out for beers afterwards. Waxed on for a couple of hours about how it's this cat and mouse game between Bureau of Land Management and the Park Service, who he said pretty well hate climbers and are just looking to throw people in jail. And so the climbers are developing new areas with pitches and roots and all of this. And they're staying about 10 years ahead of the BLM field patrol staff in terms of when the BLM find an area that people have sort of low-key developed for climbing and brought clients like SIU Forestry to go climb and go canyoneering in and stuff like that. Um, they've moved on from that spot 10 years later, and the climbers have, and BLM is just playing this sort of whack-a-mole game across tens of thousands of square miles of desert habitat um, versus the climbers. So we want to get the survey info of what people want to tell us, and we also want to look into what's like the field staff actually seeing in terms of stuff that maybe some folks don't want to tell us. And full disclosure, that day of canyoneering was one of the most fun days that I've ever had in my life. Like, that was amazing. Also, as it turns out, we broke a ton of laws. But we didn't find out about that until afterwards over beers. And I'm like choking on my beers as he's saying this stuff. But, you know, teachable moment. Anyway, so we want to look at all of our channels available after action reports, stuff like that, as well as the NVUM and other kinds of surveys, the OCCRC old school surveys, where we were asking like a representative sample of all Americans, kind of like part of the census, if you want to think of it that way of like, okay, so, you know, what are you doing for recreation? And what would you want to do for recreation if the Park Service had a way to hook you up with that? Okay, great question, great answer. Yeah, similar to that, I was saying like before taking any action, uh, evaluating that sur survey for response bias. Oh yeah. Just because like, a board in the passenger seat on the drive home might be more likely to fill out the survey than young people that went there for the weekend had fun and they're just leaving it on the way home. So okay. Okay. Like a sixty year old person's more likely to actually go like now I should pull out the survey than young people that are just like oh, on to the next thing. That is true. That's very true. And uh, there was a real sea change in the mid aughts when smartphones blew up and became a thing for everybody, not just like the D-bag with the Blackberry emailing everybody. Um, random digit dial phone surveys were a huge thing. And now, how many of you guys have a landline phone line at home? Okay. So everybody else is invisible to that nationally. Otherwise, it would be a representative survey. But the majority of people in the room aren't even in that room when you're trying to figure out that survey. So at a graduate school level, um, there's actually a ton of techniques you can kind of bake in uh, into a survey effort to make sure that it is representative and correct the proportions of contribution to downweight or upsample things that are too loud in the signal and things that are not loud enough in the signal of the data. Yeah. When I was working at the Morton Arboretum, they had the same sort of thing they were trying to work out, like increasing visitation. Okay. And one of their solutions was to try and work out like bus routes or some sort of public transportation from Chicago to like the Arboretum. 
Okay. You know, sort of similar to that, working towards the Indiana Beards to sort of promote them to people who maybe don't have a car, maybe just can't drive that car for whatever reason. Like Excellent. Trying to promote accessibility in that way. All right. So file that tactic under taking a closer look at not just who's showing up and who isn't, but the mechanics of why aren't they? Maybe a ton of people would love to show up to your national park and they just can't afford the gas and maybe they never will try to because they think they can't, even if maybe eventually they can. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, the perception drives the reality as far as making space in the budget for stuff like this. So that requires something not typically like a survey because people get stressed out and embarrassed when you ask them, how much money do you make and why aren't you spending any of it at parks, believe it or not. Um, so we use a different set of techniques, focus groups, semi-structured interviews, that sort of a thing. Again, that's more grad school level uh, field technique stuff, but if that's something that you're interested in, uh, come find me after class or after the semester or whatever and we can talk about grad school. Okay, get some good work done that way. Um, other thoughts, questions on this one, Ian? If we are seeing like a decrease in uh, visitation to our park or something, especially across like a younger demographic or something, it could be viable to like just increase advertising, especially on like social media platforms or something, like targeting a younger crowd and just like reminding people that's a thing like some people don't necessarily know that like they've got a national park a few hours away that they can drive to and have a good weekend and just putting it there and like just kind of incepting the idea in people's mind that yeah they might want to go there yeah so how can they go if they don't know and how will they know unless you go tell them right that's an idea that's thousands of years old right or shoot band there Say again? Like Horseshoe Bend. Horseshoe Bend, yeah. So Horseshoe Bend is that spot uh, on the upper Colorado River, kind of at the top end of the Grand Canyon by Vermilion Cliffs, where it used to get a couple thousand people a year, and now it gets over two million visitors a year, and nothing changed about the site. Social media happened, and people started posting geotagged photos of, yeah, this place is like, what, two, three hundred yard walk from just a highway and you can't see it from the highway there's a little rise in between Horseshoe Bend and this just long boring stretch of road outside of Page Arizona so people start posting photos and it's like oh this was a super long hard burly hike lol JK and then if you tap on the photo it shows up on the map and it's like okay I'm gonna be over that way sometime soon let me file this one away and go check it out so there was a thousand fold change in annual visitation to Horseshoe Bend once people started knowing about it. So social media can be your friend, right? If you've ever checked out the uh, National Park Service's Twitter, now it's X, account, uh, it's full of spicy memes and stuff like that. Like they do a pretty okay job of connecting with today's youth and a whole bunch of bots, which is I assume most of what Twitter is anyway. Um, so it's a good and bad thing, right? It's just, it's part of the public conversation, right? And we don't control that conversation, but we can absolutely add to it and stuff like that. So this is a part of National Park Service, State Park, National Forest Service, or uh, US Forest Service, um, kind of work that we in forestry don't really think much about. There's a whole communication apparatus. Um, Amanda Patrick was the public relations officer on the Shawnee National Forest like, I don't know, six, eight, ten years ago, something like that. And um, last I heard, she went from basically tweeting for the Shawnee and stuff like that and writing press releases, that sort of thing, and communicating with people and uh, interfacing with like local chambers of commerce, just like being the, the face and the voice of Shawnee National Forest. She got promoted and is now working at USDA Forest Service headquarters in DC and like reaching millions of people a year through her efforts. So if you're like me, maybe you're kind of an introvert and you do a terrible job on social media. 
But if you are really fast with your thumbs, you could do good forestry work. On Twitter, you could be like that fraction of a percent of all tweets that are not porn or just total trash, okay? You could be the fraction over one percenter. Cool. All right, so we've got some ideas. We've got some impacts. How's this going to work? How is it working at your park? What kind of messaging did you see about your park when you were researching it this semester? Are they connecting with you? Are they connecting with families? Are they making those opportunities intelligible and recognizable to people in a way that if you need a ride to the park, you can get one. You can figure that out or find a free one. Mike? Um, I wrote for one and said, uh, hiring rangers that are qualified for like newer activities okay. or uh, as well as like an example of glacier what they're doing a lot of other like national parks you don't really need to go in as long as you have like the backcountry like tickets uh -huh. reservations you don't need to go to, like the front desk and be like all right i'm gonna go out be like okay so we can go have fun or whatever but like glacier as well as like other national parks you have to give them like your driver's license uh information your license plate so if they find your car you've been like stuck out there for a while um have, they'll be able to know who it is but um the, what they do with uh, glacier is they show you like a bear video as well as like a, i think it was a mountain lion video as well mm -hmm. and then you talk to some old lady that like keeps telling you about mountain lions that she saw one time and but yeah they like give you like a whole rundown of what's going on out in the wilderness uh it was very helpful but i mean if they need to hire more like backcountry rangers the only time i've ever seen backcountry rangers was in yosemite and if that's like the future of these parks, then they probably need to do something like that. So the only time you've seen backcountry rangers, you're talking about at the backcountry desk or like or out in the backcountry? Like trail rangers. Trail rangers, okay, yeah, like patrol rangers, okay, cool. Yeah, we, uh, we run across backcountry rangers maybe half the time when I'm taking students out on summer camp and stuff like that, and you know, they're always very friendly and very polite and professional. And man, you better have your permit in a row when they ask for it. Yeah. We managed to uh, run into a trail hiker on uh, the Appalachian Trail, like the short amount of time we were here at the Resource Wow. One of the patrol rangers for the. Yeah. Last he I heard, there were two for the whole thing. I mean, I don't know. I don't remember the name of the person. We were at. Um, Clingman's Dome, like kind of just off to the side on the Appalachian Trail, and we were just kind of sitting there talking about Fraser Fur, and then they came like walking up the trail towards us. And talked to us a little bit about what they were doing and how they got into it. That's cool. Right on. Did you come away from that conversation with a sense of yeah, I could, I could get this job? No. Oh. I came away thinking I don't think I want this job. Okay, well, if you don't want it, that's different. All right, but you know, if you want it, you could probably, you know, just saying. All right. Are okay. Are these jobs like are they hired through the Appalachian um, Trail like, organization or? I don't know. Ready for your next scenario? As the gorillas once sang with De La Soul, don't stop, get it, get it. Cool, next scenario. Congress, in its wisdom, totally shits the bed again and reaches a funding impasse. And so the federal government of the United States, the most powerful country, arguably, in the world, at least for another 20, 30 minutes before China eclipses everybody and kills us all, The government shuts down. Like the whole ass federal government shuts down for, uh, what was the one a couple of years ago? It was like three, four weeks, something like that. So your park has to go on emergency life support, skeleton crew, only emergency essential operation staff. And that's it. What do you do? time of year does this occur? It's usually October, 
right at the beginning of the school year, so like September is when they're about to pass the budget. Yeah, which again is peak season for some of these parks. So just a quick show of hands. How many of you guys and gals have a summer peak season national park? Ozarks for sure. Yeah, okay. Who has like a spring and or fall peak season park? Yeah, okay. So our fall peak season parks, like this is the big show. You guys are humming along, <coughs> screaming along with high visitation. Places like Joshua Tree National Park. A little bit too hot in the summer for comfort, but in October, man, that's some world-class rock climbing and some world-class Joshua Tree looking at him and shut it down. There was a tremendous amount of permanent damage done at places like Joshua Tree last time there was an extended shutdown. Um, like, people were damaging the trees, they were, uh, there were a couple of people who thought it would be a cool idea to try and winch Joshua Trees at Joshua Tree National Park with their vehicles just to see if they could pull them out of the ground. Um, like trash cans were overflowing, bathrooms became unusable and, and unsafe to use because there's like raw sewage all over the floor and stuff like that. Like you can't have a national park without ongoing maintenance 365 days a year. So what do you do at your park when you got to shut down for let's say four weeks in September, October? Yeah. During like these shutdowns, government employees, like park employees would stop getting paid, right? They get further, yeah. yeah. So it's, you're not fired, they just stop paying you, you stop working until something budgets. Most time we get back very soon. Mm -hmm. But in that intervening time, a whole lot of stuff can go wrong. So you might have like one or a couple of patrol staff, one or a couple of like emergency maintenance heads of staff, making sure nothing's like literally on fire and so forth. And these shutdowns come while you're already underway with all of your visitors who are in the backcountry. So you could go on a hike at Yosemite National Park up in the upcountry for a week, 10 days, something like that. And uh, when you get out, there's nobody there. Pretty weird. It gets doubly weird when fire season extends right through September and October, right? All right, so what are the impacts? What could go wrong when all of your rangers have to go home, or effectively all of your rangers? For a month, and you've still got people in the park. What are the impacts? How could you respond in the fact, after the fact, and also plan before the fact, if you know this is coming, as it often does? And fourth, finally, what's your honest assessment of, I have some ideas, they're not perfect, no idea it is. How would that work? How well would that work out? What kind of side effects might I incur?
Yeah, absolutely you can. So, to paraphrase Brandon Lee, the son of Bruce Lee, the 1990 movie The Crow, Ranger is the name for God on the lips and hearts of all children. I mean, park visitors. So what you say goes, and you have absolute authority to shut it down if you need to. Um, if you had the person power, the staffing, you could march your teams out across the entire trail network and hike everybody out, if that's what it was. Um, that's kind of what they do when a wildfire is threatening to come through. They know there are people out, like way off in the backcountry, you may not know. Um, you can just chain off the front gate and say, look, if everybody that's not out by 8 p.m., you're stuck. Uh, or something that's a little bit more user-friendly or anything in between. Brandon Lee, incidentally, was fatally shot during the filming of that movie. One of the armorers had loaded one of the guns with actual bullets for no good reason at all. Shot in the spine, died like a day later. Also, how Bruce Lee died. Anyway, uh, well, was it was it Bruce Lee or was it another like kung fu movie guy that like had a blank that was loaded and then he like was supposed to like um, someone was supposed to shoot him in the head or something like that, but the concussion of like just the blank like uh, gave him like a concussion so bad that he died or something like that or ruptured his ears. You're nodding your head. Yes, is that Bruce Lee? No, I was just confirming that he could get damaged like that. A blank can make a like, watermelon explode. But not like a 22 LR blank, like 300 blackout, right? Like right on it. Okay. Some hammers really like that. But I think what it was, it was a real gun, and they had a misfire pre previous, and the bolt was stuck in the barrel. Oh. And when he did uh, the blank shoot, the bolt, if I remember right, the bolt came out then. So Whoops. Okay. It was something like that, but yeah, he died in a misfire accident. Okay. It was Brandon, like he was Bruce Lee's son. The crew. Yeah. Yep. Brandon Lee. Anybody got any other questions or ideas for this particular scenario? Michael. Um, Vermont, I mean, it's September, so things are really pretty cold up in Montana around that time. And I was just looking up like the statistics of like when people visit, it's mostly locals who are there in that area, so it's not gonna like affect their lives all that too much for like the summer plan. Okay. So I said to evac people out um, with like not like too crazy of like a cadence, just like get them out of the park. Um, they need to cancel plans, um, and then try and continue like some sort of form of like conservation and maintenance work. <laughs> else. Like the biggest thing that I thought would be like a change other than locals being upset, like the animal population would be more comfortable with like going to the main road and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like during the COVID anthropos, right? All sorts of wildlife coming back into places where they don't normally. Um, the maintenance of conservation efforts is going to be the hard one out of your answer there. Um, you really do have to tell everybody to go home for a while. So pretty tough stuff. I don't know, everybody I know really kind of hopes the shutdown happens. Yeah. They're going to want too often to get their pay when they're done. Yeah, as long as you can make it to the end of the, the furlough, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Furloughs are stressful. SIU had a furlough in like 2015 or something like that. People lost their minds. It was like one day a month over four months or something like that lost their shit just totally anyway uh all right we got time for one more quick one one more quick one all right next event human stain logan paul shows up at your park to make videos What are the impacts to make content, adding value, an influencer? 
his personal brand. Sponsored by Bro Dude Energy Drinks. What are the impacts? A famous social media influencer coming to your park to use it as they will. How could you plan for that to come? Because they're coming. How could you respond on site? After action? What might be some outcomes of this? Some good consequences, hopefully? Maybe some unintended consequences. Yeah. I don't know anything about this food. Uh, what kind of stuff are you talking about? What are you doing? This is the guy that went to a national park in Japan where, um, unfortunately, people self-harming were ending their own lives. Uh, he found somebody hanging in the forest and made a viral video about it and was asked to leave the entire country as a result. So when you see signs at a trailhead cautioning you not to do stupid things, it's for reasons like this. Somebody else ruining it for everybody else. But it's not just Logan Paul, right? So a lot of um, a lot of influencers, particularly those aligned with like yoga and whole living or whatever else, um, and the, the kind of people who like to drink raw water, whatever that is. Uh, you know, they like to get a picture splayed out uh, on top of a whole bunch of desert super blooms in your national park, if that's a thing. Uh, every five to seven years, every 10 to 15 years, whatever the time cycle is on super blooms at your park, if you have a desert park. And so basically, a couple of people will blast out to millions of followers, hey, this is cool, and, uh, you know, we'll sell a bunch of hair care products or something, or I don't know, make this person a bunch of money as a thirst trap or whatever people do online these days. Um, and in the process, they're basically just trampling your flowers, um, where this wasn't really a thing before. This is a new kind of use of the parks that is, um, it's a little bit hard to predict, to be honest. And it's a little bit hard to catch at first, and then as everybody else gets the same idea, it's very easy to catch because everybody's got the same idea. It's like, have a little creativity, guys, you know. So what happens when somebody has duck lips for your part, or angles, or face tune, or I don't know how people use social media these days, I kind of gave up after Reddit, as horrible as Reddit is. So the size of this one person's trip, not all that big. It's them plus a couple of social media producers, typically. Um, the problem is they're directly communicating in a parasocial relationship way that is a non-functional social assumed relationship with people uh, that this person doesn't actually know through social media and that size of group can be millions of people and the nature of transitory resources like super blooms means that there's a lot of intensive demand for social media posts uh, or consumption of those posts and so there's a lot of incentive to go hurry up and do the thing and kind of pile on that that desert bloom If you've ever seen like a TikTok video of somebody doing crow pose or a handstand on the edge of the Grand Canyon or Linville Gorge or something like that, um, it's the same thing, right? Giving bad ideas to millions of other people. And typically the post does not rack up its millions of views. Uh, while the person is still on site, typically they're moving on to the next thing. Yeah. Um, for a response, I mean, if you're ready to dive into it. Um, Go for it. For a response, I said, put, give like have a park ranger like escort the person to like high enough status, and just, like someone who's famous enough to catch them. And they claim it's like celebrity service, and like you can say they're given like the five star treatment. 
Um, and then if not, make sure just to have like law enforcement arresting people doing things that they're not supposed to. Um, especially if it's like something that used to just be like painting a picture so people don't do it afterwards because then like some article will be posted and some celebrity gets arrested for doing something that's illegal and then it won't inspire more people to go do that thing. Yeah. Probably okay. What are they doing may not be illegal. You know, when you're down in the super groups, not illegal. Depends on the super group. Well, yeah. Depends on the agency, yeah. Park service usually zero chill, yeah. I'd say the like, Department of Response plan identify the harmful activity and maybe like even just publicly shame that person on social media in such a way that like, you know, people identify that that was a mistake to do that and that it's problematic. All right, so go full Wendy's versus like Taco Bell. Yeah. People want people to hate that person and give them a fuel, you know, like. Okay. So you kind of take the wind out of their sails. You take their riz and, I don't know, just drop kick it. Yeah. yeah. Riz? Is that? I'm trying so hard, guys. Yeah. <laughs> I was sort of thinking that if, like, uh, people did see that he was at Indiana Dunes, like, their reaction would probably be pretty quick given how close Chicago is of like people wanting to go and see if he's still there or just been in the park afterwards. But would also probably be limited to the actual beaches themselves because that's usually like the main thing that draws people to the park during the peak season, which is what I was assuming this is occurring. Okay. So like just sort of increasing like a ranger presence or like just having to control the beach maybe a little more frequently than, frequently than usual just to make sure that like people are behaving themselves on like a lot of groups of young kids misbehaving or posing a risk to themselves or other people or stuff like that. Yeah. So this is an emphasis on the mob part of a flash mob, which is a social media mediated activity, but one that is typically organized and rehearsed and stuff like that. And you know, flash mob organizers, if they're responsible, will get that special use permit like we were talking about before. But for somebody who's just sort of a fly-by-night solo influencer operation kind of a thing, um, if you're in urban proximate park, you might get hundreds or even thousands of people essentially flash mobbing your park or maybe just like the beach area of your park uh, in a very unplanned and destructive kind of way. Okay. Well, we've got another minute or so, but uh, let's pack it up for now. Um, go ahead and finish out any notes that you want. Uh, I'm around for questions and go ahead and pass these in and on Wednesday we'll plan on doing the same thing. We'll kind of wrap up our semester that way. Sound good? Nice work today guys. This is, this kind of exercise can be a little bit stressful because it's a little bit open-ended but hopefully you guys got a sense of what grappling with these problems actually kind of feels like in, uh, in practice in a production environment as we'd say. All right. Cool. Sure. Got it. Excellent. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Got it. Nice work, guys. Cool. You ever been to Gettysburg? I have. I will stick it on first. Oh, I was going to say, um, yeah. I'm just not wrapping up my paper for the class. That's fine. What day is it due? Uh, it's the National Park one you're talking about? Yeah. That's not due till close of business on Friday, December 15th. Okay. The end of our exam day. Cool. Yeah, plenty of time. Uh, I have stuff written on the front of this, but it's from this class, so it makes sense. That's fine. Sense. Yeah, yeah, but that's okay. both of them are on the back sides of the paper. That's okay. So I just thought I'd like, you know. No problem, that. Sierra. My best friend went last week and he said he was super disappointed with it. What happened? He said they had no... They had like rooms of special events, but they're all closed. They said they had no special things going on. He said it was like 25 bucks to get in. And it was a 15 minute video done by the History Channel. And they had, he said they didn't have a nice diorama and a big painting. He goes, but there, was, there wasn't a single flag in there. There was no historic artifacts. Gettysburg? Artifact. Yeah. He said they had no what? historic artifacts. Of, he goes, they had one gun and one bullet out on display. Was the place being renovated or something? 
It was yeah, crawling with people last time I was there. I mean, said, just wall to wall people. He goes, people. I was extremely disappointed. He goes, and he's a big old history buff. He's like, I was so excited. He goes, it was just horrible. That's so frustrating. Yeah. I was just curious. had a bad time. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah. I was like, well, that's, you know, that, I would have think we one of the best museums in the, he's like, that's what I thought he goes. He goes, yeah, they had, he goes, yeah. like, you walk in, they have like an outer section, he goes, it was all closed, they just said they had nothing on display at the moment, at all. That's got to be, Gettysburg has to manage security concerns more than most, like, they have a whole bunch of, um, all the national parks have now, but, like, um, there's a bunch of, like, concrete landscape planner boxes and stuff in front of the yeah. visitor center and all that um, in case somebody tries to drive a truck bomb through there basically after September 11th and uh, Gettysburg has more security like not incidents but like scares or concerns from most well, maybe it was something like that to New York or something like that. Yeah. yeah yeah I mean yeah. it's he was like because I don't know if you ever been to the little museum in Pilot Knob Iron Mountain area in Missouri no. Fort Davison well, is that pretty good? Huh? Is that pretty good? It, it's fair. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's just a little. But he's like, he goes, I'm, he goes, honestly, they have more on display there than they did at Gettysburg. 